What's happening, gangsters? Welcome to episode 100 of Rube Goldberg's Adventures in Scale Modeling. I decided that uh, for this episode that I wanted to do a kind of a fundamental how-to sort of a video. Um, not so much that it's the 100th episode and that's any sort of special thing, but because I've decided that I want to start including more of that kind of video uh, in, in, my, in my library. Not so much because I necessarily think that I'm qualified to tell you how to, or that I think I'm better at how to than anybody else, but because I just feel like that for a complete channel on model making that I should have some of that sort of stuff in there. So, this first episode is going to address something that I've seen a lot of discussion about and a lot of questions from uh, folks who are relatively new to model making. And that is a complete, uh, I hope complete, <laughs> without being boring, discussion of fillers. Now, fillers are something that we all run into at one time or another in our model making journey. Uh, some types of models require more than others. If you're an aircraft modeler, you know all about it. If you build armor, maybe not so much, maybe not so much if you build cars, but it's still good information to have. My basic approach to filling is that I don't believe that there's one single filler that covers every possible scenario. Anytime that this discussion of fillers comes up on the internet, there's inevitably somebody who says, oh, well, I just use fill in the blank, and that's great. If the work that you're doing only requires one type of filler, then why use anything else? But that just hasn't proven to be the case for me. So what I propose to do with this video is give you a complete roundup of the fillers that I have used, continue to use, along with both the pros and the cons, as well as a little bit of the why that I would choose to use any particular one. So without any further rambling on my part, Let's get right into it. All right, let's take a look at the whole lineup here, and then we'll go through and take a look at the pluses and minuses of each one. Now, going from sort of thickest to thinnest, what we have here is Bondo Glazing and Spot Putty, Deluxe Materials Perfect Plastic Putty, Vallejo Plastic Putty, Sprue Goo, Mr. Uh, Hobby, Mr. Surfacer 1000, and Mr. Hobby, Mr. Surfacer 500. And then this is All Clad Micro Filler Primer, number 309, uh, specifically because it's black. Okay, let's start with Bondo Glazing and Spot Putty. Now, when I'm looking at any type of filler work that I'm going to have to do, there are basically uh, two situations that are common on a model that we have to deal with. One is where we have to fill in a joint, like say for example, the seam between these two fuselage halves if that needed to be filled in, or the joint at a wing root. The other type of filling situation is where we need to do an area fill. Uh, or a blend. That would be, let's say for example, I mean obviously I wouldn't do it, but let's say that I wanted to fill in this entire area right here. Then I would need a material that I could spread out over all of that and then sand it back down to blend it in to the surrounding uh, profile. Another situation where you might need to do a blend is if you had a step. Uh, there's one right here on this fuselage joint. Now this obviously I would probably have sanded down uh, flush uh, without using any filler, but let's say it was a situation where I had to use some filler. Then what I would want to do is add some material to the low side of the joint and sand it down to blend it into the surrounding area. That's the first consideration that I use when deciding what type of material that I want to want for a filler. And Bondo Glazing and Spot Putty is excellent for both of those situations. But it's especially good for a large area fill like that because it's what, uh, it's, it's, it's a, I guess you could say it's, it's more of a putty. It's a, it's a full bodied material um, that's got some, you know, it's got some stiffness to it. And I've got some uh, spooged out here on this piece of cardboard, and you can see that it gets kind of goopy inside the tube 
which is nothing really to worry about, but over here you can see what I mean. It's more of a paste-like material. It holds its shape when you spread it around. So if I had a situation like this where I wanted to fill in this kind of an area, then I would just use a spatula and I would just come along and just spread it around like butter. Now, as a rule, I try to never apply any filler material, no matter what it is, super, super thick. And this is one material in particular where you want to be careful of that because it's a solvent-based filler material. And what I mean by solvent-based is that it reduces with lacquer thinner, which means that it's hot. Uh, which means that it will do uh, serious damage to styrene if you're not careful. Uh, I've heard of situations where people decided to uh, use uh, something like this material to glue the nose weights into the, the front end of a model of a jet, for example, and then came back a few days later uh, or a few weeks later and found that it basically had melted the nose of, of their airplane. And that's because of the lacquer thinner. Uh, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, attack the plastic, and so that's both a good thing and a bad thing. It's a good thing because it creates a chemical bond with the substrate. And that's obviously much stronger than a material that just lays on top of it. So uh, this, one of the other considerations that I use when deciding what type of filler I want is, am I going on to bare plastic or am I working on a, a surface that's already been painted? If it's bare plastic, then I, I definitely always lean towards a solvent-based material like this. Now, there are other solvent-based materials for filler that you may be more familiar with, such as Tamiya White Putty or Squadron Green. And you may be asking, well, why am I not using those? And there's a couple of reasons that I feel that the uh, Bondo is far superior to either of those materials. Uh, let's take Squadron. Uh, first. Squadron, I have found, is quite a bit more porous af after it dries than the Bondo is. And uh, so that means that with the Bondo, you can sand it down to a finer finish and you don't have to worry about it looking, uh, looking odd when you apply, start applying paint over it because the paint doesn't want to soak in as much. Um, and that's definitely an important thing. I've found in many situations with Squadron that I had to go back over it with something else to basically seal that porosity. The other thing that I really hate about Squadron is the stupid lid that they've had on their tube. I don't have a tube of it here to show you because I threw my last one away a long time ago. Uh, the lid, if you've got one, you know what I'm talking about. It's not a lid like this that's got a bunch of threads. It's a tiny little lid that's got maybe two threads, which very quickly get clogged up with putty, which dries, and which makes it almost impossible to screw the lid uh, back on properly, and eventually you basically just end up trashing the whole tube because it starts to get dry and it's just a hassle. The other uh, material that I mentioned is Tamiya White. Now Tamiya White is also a solvent-based putty, and it's a lot like Squadron. Um, but the reason that I don't really care for it is because I find that it's very brittle. So uh, even though it sands out pretty nicely, what I find is that if I want to try and scribe a line into it, that it chips real badly. And that obviously is not a good thing. Now, uh, what am I doing here? Why am I putting some of this uh, Bondo into this little cup? That's so that I can demonstrate Another way that I like to use this material, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that it's uh, that it can be reduced with lacquer thinner, and I've got a little bit of just plain old hardware store lacquer thinner in this bottle right here that I keep handy for cleaning airbrushes and regular paintbrushes. And what I'm going to do is just mix a little bit of that lacquer thinner with some of this Bondo. And, you know, this is, there's no specific ratio that I'm going to use here. It's basically just go by feel. Uh, 
and mix it in a way that will work for what I'm about to do. So what I've created here, basically, you can see, is just a liquid putty. It's not as thin as paint, but it's definitely a lot thinner than it was. Now, I really like this because now, with this small paintbrush, what I can do is come along and very precisely apply this material to a joint like this. And this is nice because when I come up to a place like this where I've got a fuselage a panel line that's running across that joint, it would be nice to not have to come back and rescribe that later. And I find that the best way to, uh, re to take care of, of uh, scribing panel lines is to never have to do it. And I can avoid that, at least most of the time, if I'm able to apply the, the filler material to the joint very precisely. And that's what mixing it this way and using a tiny little paintbrush allows me to do. As you can see, I've basically just applied the material very carefully on either side of those panel lines. And that means that I'm a lot less likely to, uh, to obliterate them uh, in, the, in the following steps of, of finishing this out. All right, now you may have noticed while I was uh, talking that this was already starting to dry. And that's one of the uh, beautiful things about being able to thin this stuff with lacquer thinner is it does dry very quickly. Now it's not quite dry enough to sand, but this patch right over here next to it has been drying for a while. So let's just take a quick look at how that sands out. I've got a little bit of water uh, here uh, on my bench and I've got a 240 grit sanding stick which I find is good for um, first pass sanding and I just get a little bit of water on that and go at it. And you should be able to tell by the way it feels if it's dry. If you get that kind of crusty sound and feel to it then you know you're in good shape. But generally, any time within 30 minutes to an hour, you should be able to start sanding this stuff. And uh, it sands down beautifully and, and really pretty quickly, as you can see. Now, obviously, I'm getting quite a bit of uh, buildup on there from the water, so just stop and wipe that off every so often. Get a little bit more water on the sanding stick. And I'll just take a few more quick passes there. I'm not gonna worry about getting this perfect because this is just a demonstration, but there you go. You can see that that stuff sands down very nice and very smooth. And that would be a good example of using it to do an area fill. Now another thing that you might notice uh, with this, if you're able to see it there, is that the material has kind of sunk into the joint. And that's pretty normal with uh, any, you know, anytime you're, you're using a more liquid viscosity filler that it's going to do that. And the trick there is that you just keep applying it. Um, you just keep piling it on there uh, until you see that your joint has disappeared and then you come in and do your sanding work. And as quickly as this stuff dries, that doesn't take nearly as long as it, as it might sound like it does because all you have to do is give it a few minutes between coats uh, as it starts to set up and then you can add a little bit more so things Things go relatively quickly. All right, now let's talk about the next material, and that is this perfect plastic putty. Now, this again is a, a full bodied material, and a lot of people like this for one simple reason this is a water based material. So it's really nice because it doesn't have any fumes, it cleans up easily with water or alcohol and you can thin it with water and alcohol. And essentially you can treat it in all of the same ways that you just saw me uh, do with the Bondo. 
But this stuff does have some disadvantages. One the main disadvantage is that being water-based, it doesn't bond with plastic at all. So it's never going to be as strong. Now that may not be an issue, but for me, that's always a consideration. I want, I want any kind of joints or body work that I'm doing to be as strong as possible. So pretty much the only time I'm ever gonna use a water-based putty like this is uh, on top of paint. And that's where it can come in very handy. You can take this stuff and you can thin it, uh, as I said, with water or alcohol. And I've done exactly that in this situation. And I've applied it with a brush, just like I did with the Bondo. Now this is really good in a situation where you've got a joint that you need to fill mostly, uh, but you want to leave some evidence that that joint is still there. So let's say that, for example, you've got a, a, a joint where uh, at the root of your wing, and you obviously don't want to leave that huge canyon running across there, and you want to fill it in, but you don't really want it to disappear completely because it's actually supposed to be a panel line. The situation also comes up um, in, in places where you just want to reduce the depth of panel lines. Maybe they're just too deep or too wide and you don't want them to be quite so drastic. And so you want to put just enough filler in there to kind of tame them down a little bit. And this is really good. For, this material is really good for that, especially if it's on top of, a, of an acrylic primer like this is. This black primer here is Badger Steinal Res. And obviously what I'd like to do is be able to rub this back without damaging any of that paintwork. And the fact that it's water-based um, is what makes that really easy to do. So what I've done is I've got a Q-tip here. And I'm just gonna get that Q-tip nice and, and damp with some spit. And then I'm just gonna start rubbing this, this, uh, rubbing this filler until it starts to move. Now I've piled up quite a bit of it here because I wanted to make sure that I had enough and, and you can see that it's taking some effort to get it to move but it is starting to. And you'll find that once it starts to move that it, it goes pretty quickly and things get, get a lot easier. Now, I'm not gonna do this entire joint because all I wanna do is, is just enough to, to demonstrate the effect here, but I think that's enough. You can see exactly there what I'm, what I'm talking about. I've left just the material in the joint and that's gonna probably fill that joint I don't know, 80 or 90% of the way. It may look like it's completely filled right here, but once you put a layer of paint on it, you'll see that it does in fact still show. So that's a really good use for this water-based material um, when you wanna just sort of tame down some panel lines and you wanna do it where you don't have to do any sanding uh, and you don't want to obviously damage uh, any of the of the paint that you're putting out on top of. Now, if I wanted to, I could sand this filler just like any other. Uh, it actually sands pretty quickly and pretty easily because being water-based, it's uh, it's not very hard. It's not a not a super not a super tough material. You can see how it gets dusted up there pretty quickly. And, uh, and it'll sand, it'll sand down pretty smooth, but it's relatively porous because again, it's a water-based material. And you'll see that when you put paint on top of it that it'll kind of soak into it. So you may, uh, you may, that may be an issue that you have to deal with. Now, having said all of that, and those being the reasons why I really like Perfect Plastic Putty, there's one major reason why I really hate it. And that's because of this ridiculous packaging. Being in this plastic tube, it's always got air in there, and that's a real problem, especially when you live in a dry climate like I do, because the stuff dries out in the tube. In fact, the four, of, uh, the four out of the five tubes of this stuff that I've owned over the last year and a half have all either been dried out when they got here or they dried out 
um, after I opened them and I was able to use less than half of a tube. And that's really frustrating because this stuff is not cheap. It's, I think, seven or eight bucks for a tube of it. But you can see, when I take this spatula and I jam it in there, it comes out almost completely dry. And that's because the material inside the tube is no longer moist. Now, I could put some water in there and mush it around and revive it, but that only works for so long. And it's really just a major aggravation that, uh, that you have to deal with that. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's good enough for the situations that it is good for, that I've put up with that, but if I could find a replacement for it, I would uh, I would switch in a heartbeat because it's aggravating to pay that much for a material and it'd be essentially uh, useless. This tube has been opened probably less than half a dozen times uh, in the last month, which was uh, when it was opened for the first time. Now, speaking of replacing it, that's why I bought this Vallejo plastic putty, which is also a water-based material. Now, one thing that's nice about it is that it's got this little tiny applicator, and you can apply it very precisely. So that's a, a very handy thing, and you can see that it's nice and, and, and creamy. This is what perfect plastic putty is supposed to look like when it's not dried up. Now, there are people who say that this Vallejo material is exactly the same as perfect plastic putty, but I don't believe that that's the case. Uh, I was hoping it was when I bought it, but the first time that I tried to use it exactly the same way that I used have used uh, the perfect plastic putty in the past, it was uh, almost a disaster. That being that I had applied some of the material one day and then came back the next day with my damp Q-tip to rub it off the way that I demonstrated a few minutes ago, and the stuff would almost not come off. In fact, it, it basically would not. Um, and when I started sanding it, it proved to be kind of rubbery. This material is almost like uh, a latex bathroom caulk um, in that it never seems to dry, in my experience, completely hard and sandable the way that a filler material should. So the only time I use this now is in a situation where I want to put it on an area and then almost immediately come back with a damp uh, Q-tip and remove most of it. The next filler in this little roundup is sprue goo. Now, uh, if you don't know, what sprue goo is, uh, is basically a do-it-yourself sort of filler. And the way that you do it yourself is that you take like the last half an inch or quarter of an inch or whatever of Tamiya Extra Thin, or you could use MEK uh, or 10X or something similar, um, and you dissolve uh, bits of styrene in it, pieces of your sprues, hence the name sprue goo. And the kind of the cool thing about it is that you can make it to pretty much any consistency that you want. Now, I have just a bit in this jar. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, but you can see that my chosen color is gray and that if I dig some out of there, you can see that it's got a pretty, pretty goopy consistency. You can maybe see it dripping off the, I mean, I've just got a big blob of it just hanging there on the end of, of my, my tool, there it goes. Now, this stuff is really useful in certain situations. There are people who say that they use nothing but this. Um, I personally am not gonna recommend that for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that it is only uh, really applicable in certain types of filling situations, mainly joints. So if you've got a uh, a, sm a narrow gap at, you know, a wing root or some other place, then 
uh, this stuff will will uh, will sink into that gap very effectively, and uh, and it'll fill it just just fine. Um, but for anything that requires a spread or a blend or anything like that, it's not it's not that effective because it just doesn't hold its shape. It is very goopy and it will ooze into whatever uh, crevices or or whatever uh, you provide for it. The other reason that I'm not a universal fan of this stuff is that it takes a long time to cure. Uh, I typically will wait at least 24 hours, and I've had to wait sometimes even longer than that. And that's before you can do any other operations on it, like sanding it down or scribing it. And scribing it is where this stuff really uh, has its main advantage. And that is in that because it's basically styrene, once it uh, cures, it scribes just like any other bit of styrene. And so uh, if that's you know a significant consideration for you, then sprue goo is, uh, is, a, is a really useful option. All right, the next thing on in the roundup is Mr. Surfacer 1500. Now there are several other grades of Mr. Surfacer, and what these numbers mean is basically that what they indicate is the viscosity. The higher the number, the thinner the stuff is. So um, I, I guess you might say that Mr. Surfacer 1000 is half as thick as Mr. Surfacer 500. Regardless, what you're going to get when you open this bottle is, as you'll see here in a second, basically a ready-made liquid filler that is solvent-based. And you know it as soon as you open the jar. This stuff is super stout. It'll make you high. So uh, it has all of the same properties that any other solvent-based filler has except that it's already in a liquid form, which is really nice because if you've got a situation where you need to apply it with precision, then it's very easy to do that, uh, just like any of the other materials, by uh, just taking a small brush and applying it wherever you want it to be. And the kind of places where I really like to use this stuff are a lot like places where I might use a water-based filler where I am intending to uh, actually remove most of the filler using what I call the wet method uh, after it cures out. And by the wet method, I mean what I showed you earlier with the perfect plastic putty where I used a wet Q-tip to remove all of the material except what had soaked down into the joint that I was working with. And the same situation applies with this stuff, but because it's a solvent-based material, we're not gonna be able to use water or spit to do that work. Uh, this stuff is um, reduces in lacquer thinner, which is why I've put a little bit in this cup right here so that I can clean that brush. Um, and then we'll get to the business at hand of showing you how to rub this stuff back. Now, I could use that same uh, straight hardware store lacquer thinner that I had right there to do this part of it, but I try to avoid that because uh, it is strong enough that it will craze plastic. If you, uh, and I can probably even demonstrate that here, I'll get a little bit of it on this Q-tip. And if you start rubbing this Q-tip on this plastic with that straight lacquer thinner, uh, you're gonna start to see some effects fairly quickly that are not that desirable. If you look right there, you can kind of see where it's starting to, it's, it's kind of hard to tell but it's starting to uh, sort of melt the surface of the styrene right there. Now, obviously, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is get rid of the uh, excess uh, filler without causing any damage. Now, what I could do is uh, take that hardware store lacquer thinner and I could cut it with some alcohol, uh, like 
X20A or uh, some, uh, you know, just regular uh, isopropyl alcohol. And in fact, some people do use isopropyl alcohol or X20A to do this part, but I don't find it quite strong enough. So what I use is Tamiya Lacquer Thinner, which is actually a reduced strength lacquer thinner. As far as I know, I mean, it, it could be uh, basically that it's just lacquer thinner that they've already cut with alcohol for you. And it's perfect for this job because even the day after, uh, I've done this, you know, 24 hours later plenty of times, uh, Tamiya Lacquer Thinner is strong enough to get the Mr. Surfacer moving. Now, the Mr. Surfacer 500 is more difficult to get moving than the Mr. Surfacer 1000, which should really be no surprise given that it's a, a thicker material. And so you got to do more rubbing, but once it starts to go, things happen pretty fast. And the thing is that no matter how much rubbing is required to, to uh, remove the excess filler, the uh, Tamiya lacquer thinner is not going to harm the surface of the styrene uh, like straight lacquer thinner will. So. To me, this is the perfect combination, perfect way to do this. Now, the problem with using this method to tackle things like panel lines is that the wetter the Q-tip, the more of the material that's down inside the panel line is gonna get removed. And so you can sort of end up kind of doing a catch-22. See what I did there? This is a B25 fuselage. <laughs> Where, you know, you kind of end up removing most, if not all, of the material that you were trying to preserve down inside the panel line. Um, so you kind of have to develop a feel for it. You can see that there still is some in there, uh, but not probably as much as I'd like to be, like to have. Uh, given what I'm trying to accomplish there. So you just you kind of have to just develop a feel with this method for uh, for how to work it to get the results that you're after. One thing that you'll also notice is that as this material dried, that it shrunk down into the panel line. And just like I was explaining before with, with the perfect plastic putty, when you apply it as a liquid, you just basically have to keep piling the stuff on there uh, until you don't see the, 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 the joint any longer before you decide to come back and, uh, and remove it uh, using, the, using the, uh, the wet method. Now, you can also, uh, you can also sand this stuff. Uh, it sands just fine, but it takes longer for it to cure out to the point where it uh, can really be sanded very well than uh, some of the other fillers that are solvent based do. And so for that reason, I tend not to use it in situations where uh, I need to do sanding because usually um, it's just much easier to use, uh, to use Bondo for that. Okay, now along the same lines, the, uh, the next thing that I'm gonna show you is uh, the the uh, all clad micro filler primer. Now you can uh, basically think of this as being just like Mr. Surfacer that's been reduced enough with lacquer thinner to run it through your airbrush because that's basically what this stuff is. And I use it in exactly the same way. You can see here where I've brushed some of it on top of of this fuselage just to show you what I would do. Uh, a lot of times I'll use it just to check my, my, my work when I've used a different kind of filler and I wanna see if I have any leftover uh, evidence of the seam that I'm trying to fix. And sometimes I'll use it as the filler itself because when you brush it on, it goes on pretty thick, uh, not nearly as thick, uh, or not nearly as, as thick as the Mr. Surfacer stuff, but it's still thick enough that it'll do the job. And it dries pretty quickly. But again, you can see that it, it shrinks down into the, uh, the, the, the crevasse there, and so you have to keep piling it on. It's also pretty hot, and you can see uh, 
that it kind of will craze the surface of the plastic there. It doesn't do that when you spray it on because it's, uh, it's not going on that thick. But that's not a big deal because it sands out so beautifully. Uh, you, can, you can sand this stuff down to a really, really nice, smooth, non-porous surface. And so for that reason, sometimes I'll use the AllClad 309 as a sealer for um, on top of uh, Bondo or whatever, uh, some other type of uh, solvent-based filler. Uh, Squadron Green, especially when I was still using it, because Squadron Green was so porous that it really needed a sealer before you, I put any more paint on top of it. And so the AllClad 309 was perfect for that. But you can see that even when it looks like it's crazed that plastic all to hell, that it uh, it sands down perfectly smooth, no issue. So it's not really so much a mainline filler material as it is more of kind of just a, a surfacer uh, and a diagnostic tool. Now, I'm sure that by this point, some of you may be thinking, hey, he left out the best filler of all. And I kind of did and I kind of didn't. Uh, but the one that you're thinking of is this one right here, super glue. A lot of model makers really like to use super glue as a joint filler. Uh, and for good reason. Obviously, it's strong, uh, it dries pretty quickly, and it's pretty hard, and it sands out. And you can mix it with things like baking soda or acrylic microbeads to produce a material that is very tough. Um, some people say that mixing baking soda with it makes it a lot easier to sand. I I've never actually tried that, but it makes sense to me. Um, but uh, either way, um, you, you've got to get after this stuff pretty fast. That's the main thing if you're going to use this as a filler, um, is to uh, get, get after it with your sanding stick within an hour. Um, now, I've heard people also say that you should never use accelerator if you're going to use uh, super glue as a filler. I've used it both with and without accelerator, and I honestly can't tell that much difference. Uh, the main thing is is that it, is is getting to the sanding within that uh, hour. I, I typically even try to try to hit it within about 30 minutes after I apply it. Um, I don't use super glue a whole lot, but it does work nicely in situations where you've got lots of room to sand because it is tough stuff. And uh, you may need to do some scribing on top of it because super glue, uh, for whatever reason, it does scribe pretty nicely without any sort of flaking or chipping. Um, and that's one thing that I should mention about using all clad before I forget. If you're going to use this as a sealer or a, uh, as a surfacer for other bodywork, keep in mind that that all clad dries super, super hard and it's brittle and it does not like to be scribed. It, it will chip on you. So just uh, something to be aware of there. Uh, anyway, so those are just all considerations. Uh, that should help you decide which type of material you're going to use. Now, there is another one that I also did not mention, uh, and that is this right here. Uh, now, this is not in the exact condition that you'd want to use it in because uh, typically, hopefully, the joint you have to fill is not this big. But stretched sprue makes a fantastic filler material. Let's say that you've got a long, straight joint like this, and it's got a, sig a significant gap in it. The number one rule with all filler materials is to use as little as possible. And this is something that you'll find even like uh, body shop guys will tell you. I mean, we've all heard horror stories of somebody who bought a used car and, uh, bumped into it or did something to chip the paint and found out that it was a Bondo queen that it, you know had huge dents that were just stuffed full of Bondo. It obviously is a bad thing. Filler material is not native surface material. Well, in the, with the exception being sprue goo. And you always want as much of your native uh, structural material as possible. So, 
If you've got a significant gap, the best thing to do is fill it with plastic before you start filling it with anything else. And that's where stretch sprue comes along. And because it stretches out nice and straight, it's perfect for a joint like this or a wing root, for example, where basically all you have to do is stretch it to the right size, put some Tamiya Extra Thin in the groove, lay that stretch sprue in there, cut each end to length, let it cure out, and then come on top of it with the filler material of your choice. Well, of course, after uh, sleeping on all of the work I did videoing this yesterday and checking with my buddies over anything I might have forgotten, there were, of course, a couple of things. First of all, uh, some of you uh, might be familiar with the brand of solvent-based filler called 3M Acryl. Uh, and I shouldn't go without mentioning it. It's basically the same as Bondo Spot Glazing Compound, just uh, different branding. Um, and, and don't confuse the name Acryl with anything like Model Master Acryl Paints because they have nothing in common. Okay, now the other thing that I forgot is another one of my favorite filler materials that's kind of non-intuitive, but it's, it's really brilliant. And that is epoxy sculpt. This is two-part epoxy sculpting putty. And what you do is you just dig yourself an equal size chunk out of each of the, uh, the cans there. And you knead it up kind of like cookie dough until you have a nice uniform gray color like that. And that gives you a ball of material that's kind of got the consistency of Play-Doh. Now this can come in really handy where, let's say that you've got a, uh, a substantial gap that you need to fill, but sanding is not really a great option. Now in that situation, a liquid putty like Mr. Surfacer or uh, one of the water-based putties that's been thinned uh, and brushed on is not a good option because it's going to just fall down into the crevasse that you're trying to fill. So what you need is something that will hold its shape. And that's what we have right here. So take, for example, this uh, rectangular cutout where the horizontal stabilizer should go on this F22 paint mule. I'm going to just take a chunk of this stuff. And you don't have to be real precise about this. Uh, sometimes, you, you know, I'll, you, I'll roll it into sausages or whatever that might make things a little bit more efficient. But basically, all you've got to do is get yourself a piece of it that you can cram into the space that you're trying to fill. And away you go. Now, obviously, that's way more than I want. And I don't want to have to sand all of that off so what I'm going to do is just take my putty knife and I'm going to get rid of most of that. And the cool thing about uh, Epoxy Sculpt is that you've got uh, an hour or two uh, to work this stuff before it begins to, to cure. And you really need to let it cure out for uh, two to three hours before you start to think about sanding it, uh, if you're going to sand it. But that's kind of the whole point of this exercise, is to use a material that doesn't require sanding. Now, here's one of the tricks to using this stuff. You can see that it's being a little bit uncooperative and, and sticking to the blade of my, uh, my putty knife, which is obviously kind of a hassle. So here's the secret with epoxy sculpt, and that is a little bit of water. So I'm gonna just take and put some here on my bench, and I'm gonna wet this putty knife and now watch how wonderfully this stuff behaves. Putting, putting a little bit of water on your knife blade basically uh, 
turns it into a non-stick surface as far as the putty is concerned. So that gets it pretty nicely smoothed over, but obviously that's still a little bit of, of a mess. And again, the whole intent with using this material in this fashion is to not have to get the sandpaper after it later. So, here's the next really cool thing that you can do with this material. Just going to get a, uh, a, a small paintbrush and I'm going to put that in the water and just start smoothing that over. Because the magic of epoxy sculpt is that while it's while it's in its curing stage it's essentially water soluble so what you can do is use your fingers or your sculpting tools or whatever you've got to do the rough shaping and then you use a wet paintbrush or the tip of, uh, of a wet finger to do your final smoothing. And you should be able to get it into a shape that um, will, will work for what you need uh, without having to do much, if any, sanding. I mean, you might give it a quick pass of steel wool or something after it's cured out just to make sure that it's nice and smooth but this technique really does a, a pretty good job now one thing is that like any technique where you're using a wet method you're going to be uh, removing material below the surface that you're working towards and that's something that you have to take into account. Um, you, you know, I, it might be necessary, for example, if I were really trying to, to make this flush right here, I might have to come back with a, a couple of layers of uh, primer and, and maybe a little bit of light sanding. Um, again, you know, you just have to figure that out with each given situation, but you can see that I've filled in that notch pretty easily with a material that's going to be strong because it's an epoxy and it's not going to shrink much if at all as it cures out. Okay so there you go that is a pretty broad look at fillers that we might want to use in our model making efforts. Hopefully that's good information for you if you are <clears throat> excuse me if you are uh, confused about which fillers to use and what the options are and that uh, hopefully that will help you uh, choose uh, wisely. Hopefully you can also see that picking the filler to use out of your sort of quiver of arrows isn't just necessarily a simple decision. It depends on the kind of material that you're working on top of. It depends on the kind of joint or area that you're attempting to fill. It, it, it depends on what your next step is, whether you're just going to be going straight to paint, whether you're ultimately going to end up doing some scribing. How strong you want the uh, area to be is also an important consideration. Regardless, uh, there are lots of choices out there, and hopefully this video will help you uh, make those intelligently. All right, guys, as always, I definitely appreciate you watching, and I hope that uh, you learned something good today. All right, take care. Much love.